Welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I'm Paul Ndiho, and joining me on a sh Facebook Live is Shaka Sal himself, aka the Kawale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. Welcome again to Shaka Extra Time. I'm hugely terrific to be on your show. And a, a warm welcome to you, all our Facebook followers are watching us live from all over the world. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to ask uh, questions, and I mean any questions about politics and the issues on the African continent. Uh, Shaka, uh, I think uh, let's start uh, with uh, President Donald Trump's uh, first uh, foreign trip abroad. I think uh, he's had uh, some tremendous success uh, this time around. I couldn't agree with you more. As a matter of fact, I think uh, it was a huge delay great opportunity for him to at least try and change the narrative and i think he's just done that uh even uh, some of his critics uh, if i was to use uh, uh, a baseball analogy they say he hit a home run uh, was the timing was it all about timing or it was also about the messaging i think it is a combination of both uh, but especially the former uh, you realize that uh, he was actually finding himself in trouble right here in the nation's capital, especially, you know, uh, the pressure from Capitol Hill, uh, which is engaged in uh, the investigations related uh, to the Russian involvement or the Russian role in what they say is in fact trying to influence last year's presidential election. Uh, but nothing has changed as far as I, every time I turn on a TV, the criticism is still up in the air. Everybody is still talking about uh, uh, whether or not uh, his campaign colluded uh, with the Russians. Uh, Michael Flynn uh, has said, uh, for example, that uh, uh, he's not going to uh, testify, or if he does, he will testify and take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, more people are talking about, uh, as even as of yesterday, there are people who came up and said that uh, he actually reached out to uh, the other uh, intelligence agencies, asking them not to uh, uh, to uh, to cooperate with the FBI. In fact, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, that they should actually not tell the FBI there was some kind of collusion with his campaign. There's no question that uh, the situation doesn't look uh, uh, very good for him, um, especially when you mention uh, the former though very, very briefly, uh, National Security Advisor, General Flynn, who, as you say uh, correctly, that uh, he has decided to invoke the fifth. You know, when people invoke the fifth in this town, uh, people begin making all sorts of interpretations. And as a matter of fact, I recall that during the campaign last year, it was candidate Donald Trump uh, that didn't particularly really like anybody invoking the fifth, especially when it came to the issue of the emails as regards to his previous competitor, Hillary Rodham Clinton. So can you believe that uh, someone in, on his team is now in fact invoking the almighty fifth? It means probably there could very well be more than meets the eye. Uh, let's go back to his trip. Uh, he, uh, for the first time, uh, some of his critics would say that uh, uh, he bowed to the king of uh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> At the same time, uh, a couple years ago, he criticized uh, President Obama for doing the same thing. But that aside, uh, I, th I thought uh, the speech he gave to the Arab world, the Muslim world, uh, was uh, uh, significant uh, in the sense that... Uh, 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 it laid out uh, a way forward for how the U.S. is going to maybe engage these uh, countries uh, in terms of uh, foreign policy and how to fight uh, uh, terrorism. As a matter of fact, um, I heard some pundits talk about uh, how Donald Trump is learning very, very fast uh, how to be a president of the United States, and uh, especially when you are visiting uh, some of these people that uh, you regard as key or major allies. It's very interesting, especially when you think about uh, him being in uh, Riyadh, uh, being in Saudi Arabia, meeting the king of Saudi Arabia, and uh, somewhat symbolically, uh, almost in fact, behaves uh, symbolically just like his predecessor actually did. And uh, you know 
how he came under intense criticism that uh, he was probably shortchanging the dignity and the image of the only superpower on this planet Earth, the United States of America. But let's face it, um, I think uh, Mr. Trump has actually done himself well. He signed uh, a deal of uh, more than 110 billion U.S. dollars. That's a lot. He also um, was able to address a very hastily convened uh, regional summit uh, of leaders that uh, represent Muslim uh, majority countries and what have you, including several African leaders. I saw especially uh, the president of Chad, Idris Deby, uh, in, the, uh, in the conference. So he's doing very well. He actually obviously moved on to uh, Israel, and I saw him uh, addressing the international media and uh, talking about uh, how he would like, for example, to visit uh, Jerusalem, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember that uh, uh, Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, talking about uh, how a one-time great American president, Abraham Lincoln, had in fact the wish of visiting that holy city, Jerusalem. Uh, uh, th 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 that point uh, is well uh, taken, Ashaka. Uh, let's uh, go back again to uh, to his visit uh, to Jerusalem uh, this morning uh, before he left for uh, uh, for Rome. Uh, he went also and met uh, with uh, Abbas. Uh, was able to tour the holy uh, the holy land. Uh, but uh, when you look at it uh, from uh, the viewers' point of view, or people who are not even watching this program they would say that, wait a minute, America is just playing double standards. Uh, I don't think they're interested in seeing a, a two-piece uh, solution. America is only is interested in that region is uh, the protection of Israel. What are your thoughts on that? On the contrary, I think, in fact, it is uh, previous American administrations, probably beginning with uh, uh, Bill Clinton, if I remember correctly, uh, who came up with that idea, that initiative, uh, of making sure that uh, there is a place for the Israelis uh, side by side with the Palestinians, even though the, uh, uh, for the most part, frankly, uh, the security will be taken care of by the Israelis. But I think that um, they are really serious, and that is, uh, you know, and uh, when you think about it, uh, um, the Arabs, uh, you know, countries or the Arab countries are also beginning to be not only very powerful, but also very influential. Think about that kind of deal, for example, that uh, President uh, Trump and uh, the Saudi king signed 110 U.S. billion dollars. Can you imagine how many job spin-offs, for example, will come as a result of that kind of deal? Do you imagine or envisage, for example, the United States signing a deal with the state of Israel uh, for that kind of money? About what? Uh, but some people could argue that there is actually even no reason for the United States to engage in that kind of deal because they're already intertwined. They're already, Israel says this and United States, they, they do all things together. There's no need for them to be engaged in that kind of thing. And that's true too, yeah. but Paul, you have to realize at the end of the day, the United States is not uh, a socialist country or even a uh, a kind of uh, democratic socialist country like the Nordic countries, the United States uh, prides itself in being a capitalist society uh, that in fact uh, believes in terms of free trade. And uh, you know, there is a saying that, uh, show me the money. Uh, that used to be said, I think, uh, in the state of Arizona uh, which at one time produced uh, one great American president, uh, Truman. Truman himself, who obviously helped to win the Second World War. So, my friend, capitalism, jobs, jobs, jobs. You have a President Trump who came on the platform of talking about uh, wishing to have a great America again. So, I don't think, frankly, that uh, when you talk about money, money and money, you're talking about something. Somebody has to have at least a say in what is happening around their neighborhood. 
Uh, talking about money, uh, candidate Trump, when he was campaigning, he criticized the Clinton campaign and uh, 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 Secretary Clinton herself of having received money from uh, these foreign entities, uh, 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 rich people in Saudi Arabia, everywhere, including the Russians. But his own daughter, Ivanka Trump, uh, just got $100 million from some of these uh, rich Saudis. Uh, how would you... Uh, uh, I guess I'll put that into context for us. What does that mean? First of all, when you think about uh, politics, um, that frankly is not uh, a particularly big deal, really, because let's face it, uh, at the end of the day, Paul, when it comes to politics, it's about interests. When you talk about campaigning, it is like you trying to court an incredibly young, beautiful lady to be your wife. Uh, you put your best foot forward. And so when the candidates are campaigning, they do it in poetry. They promise heaven on earth. The fact of the matter is when they get into office, when they become elected, they have to deal with the social, economic, political realities right on the ground. And I think what you're looking at now is the difference that has necessarily to come about anyway between a candidate, Donald Trump, and a president, Donald Trump, who happens to have a lease right now, at least for the next four years, in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, perhaps, or arguably, the most important symbolic political address on this planet Earth. Uh, let's uh, go to Rome. Uh, President uh, uh, Donald Trump just uh, uh, arrived in Rome shortly. And uh, uh, I'm just curious to know uh, how significant this trip is, uh, considering the fact that uh, earlier Leona was actually talking to our technician here, Theo, who was talking about how the Pope, for example, criticized Trump of building the wall. He said that uh, instead of building the wall, they should actually be taking those walls down. Uh, I'm just curious to know uh, how this whole thing is going to work out. One is pro-immigration, uh, another one is anti-immigration. Well, first of all, it's a great opportunity for both men to meet and exchange views and compare notes. But let's face it, uh, there is enormous, uh, there is enormous, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, positive kind of stuff that is coming out of this uh, trip, especially if you are a Donald Trump, uh, you are flying out of the holy city, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and you are heading to Rome, the Vatican. Uh, perhaps, of course, uh, for those uh, students of history, this is the only symbolic importance or symbolic uh, institution that is a remnant of what was once the great Roman Empire. And so you are really here talking about blessings. So frankly, uh, you're talking about the President of the United States, uh, very much really enjoying blessings right from Jerusalem to the Vatican. And let's talk about the war. He talked about the war when he was candi candidate uh, Trump. Uh, he's been trying to talk about it here, but he doesn't frankly seem to have any support or drawing any traction on Capitol Hill. And let's face it, the beauty of American democracy, unlike, for example, the developing countries where some of us came from, is that the past is controlled by Congress. It's not controlled by the executive. And so, yes, he can talk the talk, but can he, in fact, walk the talk when it comes to that war? The jury remains out. Okay, that's a good uh, segue to our next uh, segment. Uh, let's go to the comments. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let us start uh, in uh, uh, South Sudan. We go to Jackson Sururu. Uh, Shaka, do you think the peace deal announced by President Salva Kiel of South Sudan without the inclusion of the main rebel faction, the SPLM-IO, can bring peace to South Sudan? You know, Jackson... Uh there is a saying that uh, when it comes to peace, that one, you have to make a deal with your adversary. You do not make a deal with your friends. And what is lacking in southern Sudan, really, is that 
everybody, right from President Sarvakir, some of his regional uh, colleagues or supporters or whatever, they seem to be very busy trying to avoid the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is a doctor, General Riyak Machar, who happens to be the chairman of the SPLA in opposition. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to figure out a way of engaging him and figuring out how, yes, you may not love one another, but unfortunately or fortunately, you have actually been condemned to breathe the same air. They have to figure out how to do that, at least on behalf of their own people, even if they personally do not like one another. Part of the problem of South Sudan is pretty much symp symptomatic, really, of what happens on, in most of the African countries, where there is either uh, no peace is evident, or there is poverty. People do not have a guarantee of three meals a day. People do not have unfettered access to drugs when they get sick. It's precisely because, as some, some critics are saying, there is the absence of leadership. Or in fact, it could be summed up into leadership deficit, or leaders who do not have the vision thing. Because if they did, really, they would think in terms of putting the interests of their countries and their people above personal and family and self-interest. How about, how do you respond to critics who say that maybe it's about time, uh, both leaders, uh, Riyak Machar, uh, Salva Kiel, and all the other people who have been a uh, part of this uh, problem, the war, the ongoing war in South Sudan, to be taken out of the picture, maybe we can have a fresh start. Yes, I've had uh, people, in fact, coming up with uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, suggestion, uh, uh, that kind of an idea. But let's face it: who are those people? At the end of at the end of the day, whether you and I like it, or whether the pundits like it, or the observers like it or not, the fact remains that these people are very influential in their respective communities and they are considered by their own people as their leaders. And so, at the end of the day, frankly, I think we should cede that ground to the people of Southern Sudan. I think at the end of the day, if there is going to be something uh, viable, something that uh, can be sustained, uh, if you can, in fact, restore peace in that land, that, most, uh, that newest land, obviously, in terms of uh, world politics, it is the newest nation, uh, a country, frankly, most people will tell you, uh, should not be in the business of killing each other because, in fact, on the contrary, mm. it is so underpopulated when you consider its size and resources that, in fact, it should be even thinking about recruiting other people to come and help develop that country because, at the end of the day, man, there is almost anything you can think about in that place, except, of course, if you are thinking about manna from heaven. Interesting. Uh, let's go to uh, another comment uh, fro uh, from Zambia. Uh, Chama Chama uh, says, uh, Mr. Shaka, America and Western countries are destroying politics in Africa. When an opposition leader commits a crime and he's arrested, they call that dictatorship tendencies. For example, in my country, Zambia. Yet uh, opposition leaders in other countries are convicted, but America and the rest of the world uh, stay silent. Uh, your thoughts on that? I'm afraid um, I do not really necessarily agree with Chama Chama, uh, because I don't honestly think that uh, what is happening in Zambia uh, is largely because uh, of America and Western nations and what have you. I think at the end of the day, uh, Zambians need to learn to own the responsibility of being Zambians uh, and being very patriotic Africans uh, and figuring out a way again, like in southern Sudan, how to live together, how to accommodate one another. As I was talking before the show, it is not about, frankly, whether one is right 
another one is wrong. What is very, very important is to be perceived to be fair. And I think the politicians in Zambia, all they can in fact do is borrow a leaf or even a cue from some of their iconic leaders. And I'm talking about, for example, founding president, Kenneth David Kaunda, a man who happened to be at the political harem of Zambia for 27 years, a man who built universities, built the infrastructure and what have you, because the last time I checked, when it was Northern Rhodesia, before it was renamed Zambia under Kenneth Kaunda, I remember there were only two secondary schools because Northern Rhodesia used to be essentially uh, a labor recruiting you know, ground to go and work in what was known as Southern Rhodesia, which later became Zimbabwe, where obviously uh, President Gabriel Robert Mugabe has uh, been, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, president and leader for the last 37 years. Yeah. Let's face it, you have to take a cue if you are Eddie Galungu from your founding president, who fortunately is still alive. And the last time I checked, he was celebrating 95 years of good life. You have to borrow a leaf from a former president, Rupia Banda, a gentleman, as in, as you know, I used to be once in the military and we used to pride in saying an officer and a gentleman. And I think Rupia Banda is an officer and a gentleman, a man who was an incumbent president in 2011, lost the election against Michael Sata, considered a defeat with grace, and he still lives a good life. I think, frankly, Mr. Lungu should figure out a way of meeting his brother, Hakainde Hichirema, so that they can figure out how to be competing, perhaps, about who is the better person or the best person in, this, you know, in the business of being patriotic to his country. Because let's face it, I don't see, frankly, why Hichirema should be in prison, especially because of the nature of the crime. Mm. A man found on a highway where the president was being driven and all that kind of stuff, and he was the only, the only person on the highway from the information I have. To be honest with you, you would have to assume, at least when it comes to legalisms, that a suspect is presumed innocent until proven yes. guilty. But in this particular case, I could hazard to guess, so I may hazard to guess, that in fact, HH, as he is popularly known, as we talk, is presumed guilty, and probably he has to be proven sooner or later very guilty. <laughs> That's uh, the story of uh, some of our African uh, governments. Uh, uh, let's uh, talk. Uh, this guy uh, from Godwin Mwenya, he says, Shaka, is the rule of law applicable in Africa? If not, uh, could uh, the reasons be for its failure? Uh, if yes, uh, what nations could be best examples for this kind of application? I think it uh, ties back into what you're just talking about in Zambia, where somebody is guilty before uh, he, you know, uh, is proven innocent, you know? I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. And uh, I think essentially what is needed is sincerely, when you look at the big picture, or when you look at the forest, as somebody would say, instead of trees which are going to fall down, um, is that what is essentially needed on the African continent is democracy. 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 By that, what do I mean? I am talking about a society where you have a system that has inbuilt checks and balances that you have, in fact, an independent judiciary, an independent legislature, an independent chief executive or executive branch, for that matter, and that under no circumstances should, for example, the executive be in a dominant role whereby it expects 
for example, the judiciary and the, the legislature to be subordinated to it. Unfortunately, that is what is happening across most of Africa. And for those three organs or three branches of government to exist independently, you also need another branch, the fourth branch, normally referred to as the fourth estate. And I'm talking about the media. And today, I think we are even you know, in better shape because we have social media, which has obviously produced a lot of uh, uh, civil journalists, as it were, civil sort of journalists, as it were. And I think that we need the media to help bring about accountability. And we also need a very active civil society. Uh, let's go to maybe our final question. Uh, it's from Okwerere Moses. Uh, he says, the war in uh, CAR between Muslims and Christians, what's the way forward? Moses, I don't frankly think that uh, it is Muslims and Christians. I think there are some elements here who happen to be politicians, uh, who obviously happen to be very influential, uh, but they also, at the same time, they happen to be very selfish. They are simply thinking about uh, their stomachs, the stomachs of their families, and some of their relatives, but not their community or society. I think what is needed sincerely, again, is leaders that look at their country and look at their people with respect, uh, not with contempt, you know, not contemptuously, and think in terms of bringing people together rather than dividing people together, either on sectarian grounds, meaning Muslims on one side, uh, and then Christians on the other. In fact, if you look at Christians, they are not united either. You may probably also see that Christians are divided in terms of here is Protestants and the other are Catholics and what have you. At the end of the day, it's not about ethnicity. It's not about uh, sectarianism. It's not about clan. It's not about how tall, short you are, or female, or male. It is about social economic justice for everybody. Uh, very briefly, what are you talking about tomorrow on uh, Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about uh, something very interesting. It is called, very briefly, the significance of Africa Day. What is Africa Day? It has variously been referred to as Freedom Day, and in another case uh, as uh, Liberation Day. We're talking about May 25th, 1963, which was the birth of what was then called the Organization of African Unity, or AU, which eventually uh, transformed into African Union in 2002 in Durban. The question is really, do ordinary Africans sincerely, do they know the significance of this day? Do they even care? That's what we are going to be looking at.